So thank you guys very much. Uh, my name is Terry Ryan. As I said, I work for Google. Uh, I'm a developer advocate for Google, which means I spend half my time trying to break our product uh, so that I can go out the rest of the time and talk about it to, to people. I'm not really going to be talking much about Google stuff. Um, and I'll give more of my background as, through the course of this talk. Um, before I get started, though, I kind of want to know who you guys are. Um, so we got the who's been here to a DevOps days before, but I guess how many people here spend like all of their time developing and don't get too much into the system stuff? Okay, and what about the reverse? Okay, so it seems like there's a really good mix of people that are doing both dev uh, DevOps or de development and operations. Awesome. Um, okay. Uh, and any, any non-DevOps people in the room, like managers or, yeah? OK, all right. Well, there's not that many of you, so manager jokes are going to happen, right? Just, <laughs> sorry. We outnumber you. All right, uh, so does this sound familiar, right? You go to a conference, maybe like this one, and uh, you pick up new ideas, new things that you want to try, new tools or techniques, and you're like, this would work so well in our company. Uh, and you get excited about it, right? You're like, this is something I really want to do. And you, you pour through your environment. Like, does this make sense? Is this the right thing? I think it is. I, I think this could really help us out. I think this could make our operations go a lot better. I think th this could make my daily, like, all of our daily lives better. And you share it with your coworkers, and they're not that receptive. Um, you know, not just no, but hell no, right? Like, just get out of here with that. Um, and so you find yourself here, right? Dreams crushed. Um, your, your new shiny thing is not, uh, is not coming in. Um, and I, I hear some laughs, I hear some nods. So how many people have been there? How many people have? So look around. It's OK. It's all right. See, if, you, if, you, if you've experienced this, you're absolutely not alone. And early, earlier in my career, um, when I started experiencing this, I got a piece of advice. And that piece of advice was, change your organization or change your organization, which like, is a really shitty way of saying, like, either change your company or leave. Um, but I've all, I never really liked this piece of advice. I've heard it, I've heard it like once or twice applied appropriately, like where the organization is abusive. Um, but for most companies where you're just not getting changed the way you want it, this is crap. Um, because it has a certain conceit baked into it, which is that you can actually leave one organization, go to another, and not experience this problem of having difficulty selling technical change. Um, so here's where I give a little bit of my background. Um, I work for Google. Before I worked for Google, I worked for Adobe. Um, I'm sorry. And then before Adobe, <laughs> any, any security-minded people, sorry. That was, uh, it wasn't my code, but... Uh, it, yeah, probably was not. Uh, and uh, before I worked for Adobe, I worked for uh, a place called the Wharton School of Business. Now, I'm outside of the US, so I, I, I doubt people are familiar with the Wharton School of Business, but it is inarguably one of the top 10 business schools in the world. It is arguably the number one business school in the world. Usually that argument is from somebody who goes to the Wharton School of Business. They're MBA students. Um, and they were competing, when I, before, I, before I joined, they were competing with Stanford and Harvard um, for Mindshare, for students. And uh, you guys have heard of Harvard, I, I would imagine. It has a really strong brand. Um, it also has a giant endowment. They can do a lot for their students. Stanford is uh, right near Silicon Valley, so had a lot of, uh, had a lot of ties to technology, uh, make it really easy for people to enter the valley. So uh, the Wharton School, uh, you guys may probably not know it, um, so it doesn't have the brand recognition. And uh, it's in Philadelphia which is decidedly not southern, you know, uh, coastal California, right? Uh, if you've ever been to Philadelphia, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you haven't been, I, I don't know the right metaphor. I, I don't want to step in any, like, local regional things. I've heard Liege uh, would be a good, <laughs> would be a good uh, kind of uh, uh, comparison. Um, but, uh, so how did it compete? It competed by saying, we're going to make technology ubiquitous. 
And so we had like five years before everybody had like the advanced classroom where like there's one classroom you go into and you know, again, this is like 15 years ago where uh, like everything's automated, the, everything's controlled from a central podium um, and everything's wired up to the computer. Like all of that, we had five years before anybody else. Uh, we had a portal before Yahoo existed. We had uh, a Facebook before Facebook existed. And we won awards for our technology, both industry and sort of like journalistic awards. Um, we, um, we had students come back and say, I, have had, I had a better technology experience at Wharton than I had at my Fortune 500 company. Now this isn't me bragging about Wharton, this is me setting up like the punchline, which is all of this, like most of the practical things that I learned that I want to talk to you, I learned at the, the Wharton School of Business trying to convince people who wouldn't move to new technology. This is a place that competed with technology and saw positive results, and I still had that problem. Moved on to Adobe. Adobe, technology company, you'd figure, eh, it wouldn't be that big of a big deal. And that's what I thought, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to another company, I'll be fine. No, Adobe had these problems too. I now work at Google, and if there's a company that values technology more than Google, I don't know who they are. Um, and yet, I have these problems at Google. Uh, uh, to give you a real concrete example, people, we do not need to store everything in spreadsheets, especially when it could be a relational database, <laughs> right? Like, so we have, you'll have this problem anywhere. And so the idea that you could go from where you are to another company and not experience this is a myth. Um, it doesn't, it's not true. But what I have noticed in trying to convince new pe people to come to new tools and new technologies, people tend to resist in patterns. Um, at the time that I was kind of coming up and formulating on this, I was very much into uh, design patterns um, and anti-patterns, and I realized it's an anti-pattern. Um, people tend to resist in patterns. And so if you can identify those patterns, you can figure out that certain people, certain patterns can be countered by certain other things, right? So you have patterns and you have tactics to deal with the uh, anti-pattern. So I came up with a process, right? You identify the pattern, you identify the type of skeptic you're dealing with, you match them to countering tactics, and then you implement a larger strategy um, in order to uh, affect change. Now, this is incredibly simple, right, as written out here. And it actually is relatively simple and straightforward. I think as I go through this, you're gonna say like a lot of this is common sense, and it is. I wanna make sure you understand that simple does not mean easy, right? Like rolling a boulder up a hill is relatively simple, you know, apply force thusly, but actually doing it is a lot of hard work. And that's the same thing here. It's very simple, um, but it is hard work. So before I go any further, a lot of times I give this talk and someone will say like, well, you know, you're kind of glossing over the fact that like, how do you know this is the right technology? So I'm gonna assume you're not just pushing shiny for shiny sake, and your technology would actually change things for your company, but yes, you do need to de determine whether or not the technology actually like, makes sense for you guys, but like, like, that's a whole other conference of talks, right? Like whether or not NoSQL versus SQL is right for you, like, like those types of, you know, whether you're gonna use Chef or Puppet, like those things, like that, that's like a completely different discussion. I'm going to assume all of you have done the work and what you're, what you're trying to sell is, uh, is uh, correct for your environment. Okay, so skeptics, people in your neighborhood. So you're gonna see uh, caricatures of people up here. You may recognize yourself in them. Uh, I recognize myself in them. It's okay. Uh, I'm not trying to hurt any feelings. I'm just trying to like highlight the differences, right? And we understand that more real people are more complex. Um, so, we start out with the uninformed. These guys are pretty straightforward. They do not know about the tool or technology you're trying to encourage to be used. It's, it. it's easy, right? You tell them about the tool or technology and they, they're no longer uninformed. Danger is they may become another one of the skeptic types, so it's fine, um, but uh, these guys are great in that if you can manage their change from uninformed to informed, um, you can probably try and steer them from one of the other skeptic types. Next is the herd. Um, we, uh, there are people that come to work, uh, work nine to five or whatever the hours are here, and uh, go home. And they leave work 
at work and they have home at home. Um, but you guys are taking part of a conference in the middle. Like you guys are clearly more motivated than that. Um, and I'm not taking shots at either side of this. Um, most of the work is done by people who work nine to five and that's all they do. Um, but these people aren't going to discover new things on their own. They're not going to, they're not going to completely change the way things are because they're just sort of like they're doing what they're told. Um, your role in bringing them over to a new tool, tool or technology is to give leadership. Um, they're relatively easy to lead. You just have to do the work of leading them. Next is the cynic. Um, so there's, two, there's sort of two motivations to the cynic. First off, healthy cynicism is good, right? Playing devil's advocate is good. These are, these are things that are, are good to do. However, um, there are some times where people are being cynical or being uh, questioning, like knee jerk, right? Like I, I'm just going to automatically say no to everything. The other part of this is that we live, we kind of work in a technical field. We, li we work in a field of the mind and being smart, being perceived as smart is currency for us. And there are two ways to be smart, to be seen as smart. One is to study and prepare and test and do a lot of work and, and make sure that you know what you're talking about and, and really have experience with deep in the weeds of what you're, the tool or technology you're talking about. Or you could just ask that guy a loaded question and make him look dumb, right? Um, and I'll, I will, early in my, earlier in my career, this was, this was totally me. Like, and, and you have this in work, you have this in school, right? The, the person who's always asking, always trying to show that they're smarter than the professor. Um, that's what this is. Um, and so it is difficult to counter, um, but there are a couple tools and techniques that I'll go in later and kind of talk about what you can do to manage around them. Next is the burned. Um, these guys are kind of like the cynic in that they are opposed to the tool or technology you're talking about. The problem is, is they have experience with either it, whether it's the actual tool or technology or the class of tools or technology, and uh, they, they are not like, not only do they disagree that it works, they have like a good anecdote and data that says this won't work. Now, if the tool or technology is actually right for your company and they've tried it and it hasn't worked, Couple things might be in play here. It might have been too early. Um, it could have been a flaw in the implementation that they did, which then you're going to have to dance around that. Uh, you're going to have to use a little diplomacy to dance around that. Um, but they are very damaging to this case because uh, they can speak very uh, from their own experience of why things, are, why, why this won't work. Um, the time crunched. You know these guys. Um, they are so so busy. They, in fact, schedule multiple meetings with you to make sure you understand how busy they are, right? Um, and, and so these guys are a peg processor, right? They're always running at 100%. If you try to introduce something new, they can't because they can't stop. They are, they are, they are treading water, um, and they cannot bring in anything new, or they will drown in what they already have. Um, so if you can convince, this, and this, these, this is a tough group to convince, but if you can convince them that you will save them time, that uh, in three months from now, they'll be in a better place if they just adopt what you do, um, you, might, you might be able to bring them on board. And I'll talk about kind of tools and techniques you can use to bring them on board. Finally, the boss. Um, the boss uh, in this instance doesn't necessarily just mean your actual manager. It's anybody who has decision-making ability but is not making decisions from a technical perspective. So someone who signs a check, a customer, a client, any, any one of those types of uh, relationships. And they're not so much automatically opposed to what you're doing, but oftentimes when we address them, we talk about our technical solutions uh, in terms of our problems instead of their problems, right? Uh, if we go to this thing, it'll be a lot easier to maintain uh, our software. Eh, maybe. If you say, if we go to this thing, we'll be able to save 20% uh, ongoing maintenance costs, that's different, right? Like you're now talking their language, you're talking cost. So the challenge is to make your tool or technology a solution to their problems, not necessarily just a solution to your problems. Finally, we have the irrational, right? 
Rational or anybody who has a problem, like everyone else before here has legitimate issues, right? The burned has tried it before, hasn't worked. The boss, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a solution to their problems. Even the time crunched and the cynic, like actually objecting to whether or not this thing works or not is fine. Uh, but the irrational are not objecting for technical reasons. And it could be, um, you know, uh, you screwed up the first day of work, right? Like you flipped the switch that no one is supposed to touch, but there's no sign that says don't touch this. And so like you took down like, you can cost people like a couple days of work or something, right? Uh, happens on your first day all the time, right? Um, and so now whenever you say anything, it's just crap, right? Like they, they, they have no interest in it because you, you're the guy that did that and like, they're gonna, they're gonna not forgive you for it ever. Um, maybe it's like a racism or, or sexism thing, right? Like a woman suggesting it, I don't care, right? Like I don't hear it because it's a woman. Um, regardless of the reason, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, from a HR perspective, it would matter, but from a selling uh, technical change perspective, it doesn't matter. Um, because the solution is the same, and I'll talk about this, but you basically ignore them. You, you, any amount of time you spend on these people is time wasted because when you let, they're gonna, they're not going to present as like, oh, I have, I have a serious HR actionable objection to this person. Um, they're not, they're not going to say like, I'm, I'm disagreeing because you know they're a woman, or uh, they they screwed up something, they can't because that's unprofessional and we tend to punish that. So what they do is they, uh, they hide as another type. Um, my favorite example of this is uh, I worked with a guy who, um, and I say this out loud, it sounds ridiculous, but I swear to God, this is, this is, this is what he believed. He, or this is what he said. He, <clears throat> we were working with, uh, it was, this was way back, so it was like SQL, it was Microsoft SQL 2000. And he didn't believe in indices in a relational database. You might be saying, I'm sorry, what did you just say? No, I swear this is what this guy said, right? And his, his line was like, you know, uh, relational databases, you know, indices cost time and, and, uh, and our machines are powerful enough. And it was like this garbage soup of, uh, of explanation for it, but whatever. He was a manager, uh, so we had to sort of like work around him. And then a year later, we were sort of switching to uh, another um, sort of another framework that we were using. And then he started bringing up all these performance issues with the framework, specifically around the database. And so he didn't care about performance earlier, but now he cares about performance. And and what it, what it ended up being was that was not what was going on at all. He just he was a manager who also had to develop at the same time because management had this idea of we've got two developers that came up together. Uh, we can't have either one of them report to one another. So we're going to, instead of promoting one to manager, we're going to promote both the manager, but have them both develop and manage at the same time, which is a terrible, terrible idea and leads to people like this who are so out of, like, so so unable to do new things and bring in new stuff that they couldn't, they, they, you know, they came up with things like, I don't believe in indices, right? So again, it doesn't matter why this person believes what they believe or, or is doing what they're doing, um, because you, any, any amount of effort you spend on them, uh, the only effort you spend on them is figuring out that they're irrational. You figure out by noticing that they jump from type to type, um, but once you figure it out, just ignore them. So tactics. What can we do um, to, uh, you know, uh, to actually make change happen? So these are going to depend on the personality type. And at the end, I have a chart that like, links all the personality types to which, uh, which thing will work on them. So there are two types of tactics. First are universal. Like You can just choose to do any of these. You can just say, I'm going to do this and do it. Um, they have moderate impact, though. Um, but on the other hand, you have these situational ones. You have to have an environment that has... Uh, sort of the pieces to, to take advantage of that, uh, that tactic. Um, they're only useful in some cases. You have to have the environment, but when they work, they work really, really well because you have the right pieces to, to make it work. So let's start with um, situa uh, or universal. You can just use these. Expertise, one. Uh, learn, uh, become an more expert with whatever tool or technology you're talking about. You don't have to necessarily become like industry standard expert but move to a place of expertise with it. Um, and I, I kind of, I like that metaphor of moving to expertise as opposed to becoming an expert. Um, because quite frankly, uh, 
as soon as you become an expert, like you're, you're, like the technology is changing so rapidly that your, your expertise decays as soon as you have it. So you're always sort of moving towards expertise. And the reason why is when someone comes to a new tool or technology, a lot of times they have a translation problem, right? Like, how do I do this with this technology? And like the terms don't even uh, make sense. That's my alarm going off, I apologize. Um, hold on a sec, I'm gonna... That's gonna drive me nuts. So when someone's coming to a new tool or technology, um, a lot of times they have a translation problem. Like how do I get... Uh, how, you know, uh, I just learned recently, within the last two years, I learned Go. Go is different from any other language that I dealt with, and it's not really object-oriented, but it is. But like, what do I, how, do I, how do I package together a whole bunch of functions into one uh, item, right? And it took me a long time because I didn't have the right search terms. Like, oh, well, it's, that's, a, that's a custom type. Uh, and, you know, a coworker was able to explain it to me. Um, if I didn't have that explanation, I wouldn't have been able to get there. Now I know Go enough, en enough that I know the right questions to ask. So in the beginning, while people are coming over, uh, if you can answer those questions for them, if you can make stuff more understandable as they're trying to learn it, you will, you will stop people from dropping off. So that's expertise. Um, delivery. Kind of goes without saying, but like, don't be a jerk about things. Um, don't say, like, I can't believe you're going that way. I can't believe you're using that. Why, why the hell aren't you doing this, right? Like, these are not winning phrases. Um, you know, and it, it's amazing how just changing your tone from, uh, why don't you do it that way, to, hmm, have you considered trying this? Just little changes in tone, little changes in the way you deliver stuff can really have a big impact, especially if, uh, if people are sort of uh, liable to go against you being able to deliver things appropriately and properly helps not drive them further away. Demonstration. Um, actually use the tool or technology to solve the problem in your company. Um, maybe on a small scale, maybe on one project, maybe on uh, one piece, but actually show it working. Because I can, you know, I, uh, I, I demo for a living, right? I, I, I work, for, I show off Google Cloud. And uh, I can tell you, like, oh, well, it scales from zero to infinite. And, like, I can, I can say that, but nothing has the impact of actually showing a demo where you actually see little machines spin up and how fast they spin up. Uh, demonstration is incredibly important. So use it on a small, tool, a small project, a small problem you have, and use that to, to make the case for it. The last one is trust. Uh, don't lie. Um, you have a long-term relationship with these people in your organization. Um, doesn't mean you necessarily have to lead with your weak spots. You don't have to say like, well, this will fail in this case, but don't worry about it. We won't have that. Like, don't, don't worry about leading with the problems, but um, don't hide them. And, don't, uh, and the other thing is FUD. Um, people are familiar with the acronym FUD, Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt. Uh, it came from the 1970s. Uh, IBM either coined the term or uh, perfected it. Uh, and what you would do is like you'd be on the fence about going with IBM technology and they'd take you out to dinner and they'd say, well, I understand, you, you have a tough decision to make, uh, but let me just tell you, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. And then they'd leave and then you'd be like, you'd have this like quaking fear of like, oh, I'm making a giant mistake. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that's how, that's how they sold. And in fact, a uh, little trivia, my, my dad worked for IBM and when he read the book that this is all based off of, uh, he was like, yeah, we totally did that. How did you know? And I was like, it's like on, it's on the internet, dad. Like, you know, like it's, it's out. Your secret is out. He's like, yeah, we totally did that. And he was like wistful about it. It was really, really strange. Um, very uncomfortable. Uh, so you're learning things about my family history. Um, yeah, so don't do that. Don't use FUD. Don't use, uh, you know, don't lie. Don't admit things. Um, and you know, you'll be in a better place. All right, now we start uh, talking about situational ones, um, ones that can only happen if you have the right environment. environment. First one is compromise. Uh, you have something that you want to push. People have something that they hate. You can combine them into two things and say, if you switch to this thing, we can get rid of this thing that you hate. Um, big example I have for this is we had a stored procedure rule at uh, back at the Wharton School. You had to do everything through a stored procedure because your DBAs were a lot better than our developers in the beginning. Eventually, our developers got better, and we didn't really need the rule, but we also had trouble getting rid of it because now the DBAs have something 
right? And they don't want to give it up. Um, but the developers hated, hated, hated stored procedures. But they also hated uh, um, uh, ORM frameworks. So they, they hated a lot of things. Um, but they hated ORM frameworks less than they hated stored procedures. So we wanted to get frameworks in, we wanted to get ORM in, uh, so we said, hey, if you use the ORM, uh, you don't have to use stored procedures, and people came over, so compromise. Uh, synergy, um, taking a organizational concern uh, and a non-technical one and tying it to your technical result. So um, new regulation comes through, and we need to, we need to change, uh, we need to log everything everywhere uh, on every transaction, like five ways, uh, five different ways, but we need to do all this logging. Um, well, you've been wanting to do aspect-oriented programming where you basically wrap code around other code uh, without changing it. Um, you've been wanting to sell it for a while. This is a great way of adding logging to everything without having to change the entire code base. So you take some sort of regulation which is not technical uh, and tie it to a, um, a technical concern. Pressure. Um, so this metaphor works in the US. Uh, it's, I don't know if it'll work here. But in the US, all lawyers use word perfect instead of word, instead of Microsoft Word. Uh, and it's really weird. Like it's, it's without fail. You go into a law office or you deal with a legal professor and they use word perfect. And so why do they use word perfect? Because all other lawyers use word perfect. So in order to share stuff, they have to do it. Um, so if you can create a solution um, that sort of requires other people to, to use it um, and to get the positive benefits out of it, they have to do it. Um, that's a great way of, of coming over. Like when uh, some of my coworkers were trying to push Git, um, a really easy way is, oh, we have all these tools. All you have to do is pull them down from Git. Like, and you don't, you don't help out any more than that. You just say, oh, just pull them down from Git. And now, if someone wants the benefit of these things, and obviously write readmes and help people kind of get started with it, but um, by putting the stuff on Git, we forced people to have to use it um, if they wanted these tools and these like scripts and stuff that made their environment a lot better. So using pressure. Um, publicity. This used to be a lot harder, but now we have GitHub, we have um, open source. Uh, it's sort of much more common for people to, to contribute to open source. But that's one way of getting publicity, right? Is getting your code out there, getting other people seeing it, uh, other people using it. Um, because one of the things you know, your company will ask is, hey, you're pushing this thing. Um, why aren't people using it? If you could say, like, actually, we, we have a couple people in the company using it, but um, we open sourced it. And actually, people are, like, around the world are using it. Um, that tends to be a good thing. But the other thing is not just external publicity, but also internal publicity. Um, make sure people are talking about your tool or solution. Um, <clears throat> one, one summer, every summer, uh, we would uh, update the flagship app for our students. It was a student portal um, and had a lot of features. And what we did is it, we, we only had two months to do it. So you would make a one year, we would do a feature push, and the next year we'd do a technical debt push. So it's feature, technical debt, feature, technical debt. Because students are only there for two years, uh, MBA students. So we wouldn't roll out new features to a new class. Uh, and by the time the, they left, new features are coming in, and it was fine. Um, but uh, one year, th uh, the group that did the flagship um, app stole a whole bunch of code from another project, a uh, project that a whole bunch of us were trying to push from, uh, it was framework-based. Um, they stole a whole bunch of code, and they used that to pay down their technical debt, but they did it really, really fast because the code was all written. So they actually were able to do a technical debt and a feature release in the same year. Blew people's minds. And so when we were talking about it internally, we were lauding their success. Like, oh, look, look at what these guys did. They, they, you know, they got it done. They got both these things done uh, in, in the two-month uh, release cycle. And so people started digging and asking, and finally got to, like, well, why, why were they able to do that? And they got to, oh, they used this thing. So by making a whole bunch of publicity, getting a lot of uh, attention to this, uh, we were eventually able to sell this internally that like, you know, they use this thing to, to speed up uh, their release cycle. So, all right, those are a whole bunch of tactics. There's a whole, whole bunch of people. Uh, how do we bring these together? So uh, first, ignore the hostile. Uh, the irrational, just ignore them. Don't, once you identify people as irrational, just leave them alone. Next, target the willing. 
there are some people, there's some types that are easier to bring over than others. Target them first um, and kind of build a bigger consensus group. Um, these are the tools and tactics that work. Uh, this presentation is online, so if you want it, don't worry about taking a picture. Um, but uh, you know, certain things make sense, right? Delivery helps you with the uninformed uh, and the cynic and the burned and helps the irrational not cause you too much trouble. Publicity helps with most types, but things like synergy of combining to bigger concerns helps mostly with the time crunch and the boss, right? So these sort of make sense. Um, so once you target the willing, um, you then harness the converted. So basically, you take everybody together um, and like be very honest and open, like we want to push this change. Please tell people about it. Um, and this helps counter, like if someone is irrational and it's personal, uh, someone else coming in and telling them might help. Um, but also, uh, any, any boss who you're going to go to in the next step to get mandate is going to ask you, well, like, <clears throat> who else is doing it? If you don't have a good crew with you, it becomes harder and harder to make the argument that you, the organization really needs it. So you might be lucky, you might kind of convert everybody and you don't have to go to the next step. But if you can't convert everybody, you have irrational holdouts, you may have to go for the next step and go get management and try to convince management to, to create a mandate for it. And then in which case, it, it's suboptimal, right? You want people to come to the new tool or technology because they come to the new tool or technology. But uh, you may just have to uh, get a mandate to bring the rest of the people on board. So. Now what? Well, first off, change takes time. Um, I, left, uh, I left the Wharton School like seven years ago. Uh, I went back five years ago, and when I left, uh, the idea of using frameworks, like I had just given up. Like People don't want to use frameworks. They don't want to use software frameworks. Two years later, they're arguing over which framework they're going to choose, because all these frameworks have proliferated. They need to combine them and, and stop doing all these things. Uh, it took two years, uh, and I was gone. Um, but uh, change still happens. It just takes time. It also takes politics. Actually, let me pander to locals, right? It takes politics. <laughs> um, you know, uh, office politics gets a bad rap um, because uh, people like, don't want to don't be involved with politics, but the fact of the matter is, is that you are. Um, the only way to really divorce yourself from office politics is to master it so that it doesn't like it doesn't play into your everyday life. Um, if you don't have to think about it because you've mastered it, politics goes away for you. Um, and you're asking people to adopt new tools and new technologies and new things. Um, so you need to adopt a new tool or technology, a new thing. And that is unfortunately office politics. There are other people in your organization that want change even if you don't know them. Uh, <laughs> they're out there. Um, grab a hold of them. Uh, help each other do this. And then finally, um, you know, we get discouraged uh, that, you know, like we, we go to a DevOps conference and we hear these, these amazing environments where we've got CL, uh, continuous integration set up. And so I just, uh, I go, I press a button, the code push goes, gets pushed up to Git. Uh, it goes out for a code review. People accept it. It automatically gets, uh, if it gets accepted, it goes to QA and it runs and it, it then moves to production. And uh, we slowly, you know, like we have this, in, this amazing environment where I press a button and stuff happens. And we think, I'm never going to get there. And it's possible you might not. Um, but between there, that like pristine, magical environment that you're in, and where you are, there are a lot of better places. There are a lot of places where more stuff, uh, you know, you're in a better spot, even if it's not perfect. And the truth is, once you get to that perfect place, it's just going to change, right? Because version two of the thing is going to come out, or version three. And so you're, change is not a destination. It's a journey, and you're always going to be getting there. So um, go start making that change. I'll leave with one last thought, which is uh, I, uh, I gave this talk in Germany in a castle, um, and they like to point out to me that the castle was older than my country, like, repeatedly. <laughs> uh, and I was like, yes, I get it, I get it, I get it. And at some point, someone was saying to me, like, you know, uh, you know G Germans don't like change. We don't want to change. Like, it's really hard to push this. And I was like, wait a minute. Uh, and, and they pointed out, like, look, you know, we're at this conference, we're in a castle, it's like a thousand years old. It's older than, yeah, I know, it's older than my country. But here's the thing, I just gave this talk in this castle on a projection screen with electricity and Wi-Fi, and you're telling me change doesn't happen? Of course it does. Um, so, so change does happen, 
even if it's slow, even if it's uh, difficult, um, and move to it because between where you are and where you want to be, there are a lot of better places. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be around. Feel free to ask me questions. There's my Twitter handle. It's the best way of uh, heckling me, asking me stuff. Thank you very much.